When anyone talks about drugs or cartel, one name pops in people's mind. Pablo Escobar. And there's a reason why he's called the Cocaine King. Hello guys, and welcome back to your favorite channel, Rich Addict. Today, we have one of the most anticipated topics of Colombian and American history. If you haven't seen any documentaries or series made to portray the character, and most importantly, how he built his fortune and how he spent it, look no further. And make sure you watch this video until the end. You may not know so many things about Pablo Escobar. Born on the 1st of December, 1949, Escobar, the son of a farmer and his school teacher, began his life of crime while still a teenager. His first illegal scheme was selling fake diplomas, which branched out into falsifying report cards before smuggling stereo equipment and stealing tombstones to resell them. Escobar also stole cars, and it was this offense that resulted in his first arrest in 1974. Shortly thereafter, he became an established drug smuggler, and by the mid-1970s, he had helped found the crime organization that involved into Medellin Cartel. Despite his humble origins, he became the leader of the Medellin Cartel and became responsible for 80% of the global cocaine supply. Which raises the question, how much did he make? While it is impossible to scale the drug money, Pablo's brother, Roberto Escobar, told that they spent around $2,500 a month on rubber bands just to hold the bills together. The estimated amount of the revenue generated by regulating drugs was higher than 30 billion US dollars. In the mid 1980s, his cartel brought in $420 million a week, which sums up to 22 billion per year. Escobar's business was so big and so scrutinized that in addition to planes, helicopters, cars, trucks, and boats, he even bought two submarines for transporting his cocaine into the United States. Escobar made the Forbes list of international billionaires for seven years straight from 1987 until 1993. In 1989, he was listed as the seventh richest man in the world. He made his endless fortune by smuggling 15 tons of cocaine into the United States. The Medellin cartel smuggled most of its cocaine straight over the Florida coast. It was a 900 mile run from the north coast of Colombia and was simply wide open. The Colombians and their American counterparts would airdrop loads of blow out to sea from where it would be rushed ashore in speedboats or even fly it right into the Florida mainland and let it crash down in the countryside. In other words, of the Americans doing cocaine, Four out of five were snorting lines supplied by El Patron. Such wealth became a problem for Escobar when he was unable to launder his cash as quickly as he made it. He resorted to stashing piles of cash in Colombian farming fields, dilapidated warehouses, and in the walls of cartel members' homes. According to Roberto Escobar, the cartel's chief accountant and the kingpin's brother in his book, The Accountant's Story inside the violent world of the Medellin cartel. Found in his written letters and records, Pablo was earning so much that each year he would write off 10% of the money because the rats would eat it in storage, or it would be damaged by water or lost. Escobar owned several palatial homes, but his most notable property was a 7,000 acre estate known as Hacienda Napolis, named after Naples in Italy located between Bogota and Medellin. With an estimated cost of 63 million, it included a soccer field, dinosaur statues, artificial lakes, a bullfighting arena, the charred remains of a classic car collection destroyed by a rival cartel, an airstrip, a tennis court, and a zoo. More on that later. The estate, the front gate of which is topped by the plane he used on his first drug run to the US, was later looted by locals, and it is now a popular tourist attraction. If you heard of the famous $2 million burnt story, it's as true as other things about Pablo. Once, he was staying in one of the houses with his daughter, and they ran out of wood to burn in the fireplace at night. Escobar reportedly burnt $2 million just to keep his daughters warm, and not just for his loved ones. Perhaps hoping to win the support of everyday Colombians, 
Escobar became known for his philanthropic efforts, which led to the nickname Robin Hood. He built hospitals, stadiums, and housing for the poor. He even sponsored local soccer teams. His popularity with many Colombians was demonstrated when he was elected to an alternate seat in the country's Congress in 1982. Two years later, he was forced to resign after a campaign to expose his criminal activities. The justice minister who led the efforts was assassinated. Escobar's way of handling problems was plata a plomo, meaning silver bribes or lead bullets. While he preferred the former, he never had to think twice about the latter option, earning a reputation for ruthlessness. He reportedly killed some 4,000 people, including numerous police officers and government officials. In 1989, the cartel was blamed for detonating a bomb on a plane that was carrying an alleged informant. Some 100 people died. After all, he was a criminal. And when things were getting rough around the edges, in 1991, Escobar offered Colombian authorities his arrest if they let him design his prison, to which, surprisingly, they agreed. As a result, the luxurious La Catedral, not only did the facility include a nightclub, a sauna, a waterfall, and a soccer field, it also had telephones, computers, and fax machines. However, after Escobar tortured and killed two cartel members at La Catedral, Officials decided to move him to a less accommodating prison. Before he could be transferred, however, Escobar escaped in July 1992. Escobar has reportedly once said that he would rather have a grave in Colombia than a jail cell in America. After his escape, the Colombian government, aided by U.S. officials and rival drug traffickers, launched a massive manhunt on December 2, 1993. Escobar celebrated his 44th birthday. The next day, his hideout in Medellin was discovered. While Colombian forces stormed the building, Escobar and a bodyguard managed to get to the roof. A chase and gunfight ensued, and Escobar was fatally shot. Some, however, some speculate that Escobar took his own life. At the height of his power, Escobar had ample money to spend, and he did. His lavish lifestyle included private planes, luxurious homes, and over-the-top parties. In the late 1980s, he reportedly offered to pay off his country's debt of $10 billion if he would be exempt from any extradition treaty. Escobar made a staggering $45 million every day and bought huge country estates, planes, and priceless dinosaur fossils for his children to climb on. Even so, the money kept coming in faster than he could spend it. The Colombian banks refused to touch his dirty cash, so he stashed some in Swiss accounts. That money is now lost for good, as only Escobar knew the account numbers. He hid far more, shrink wrapping it in huge stacks and burying it in plastic barrels or metal boxes, along with thousands of gold bars, wherever he thought it would be safe. Roberto Escobar pictured Pablo's brother and the cartel accountant claimed the family had so much money hidden across the country, they literally had no idea what to do with the fortune. However, this legacy came to an end, but his name lives in books, documentaries, and stories. More than 25 years have passed since Escobar died on that rooftop. Despite the violence and brutality that filled his life, Escobar was looked on favorably by parts of the Colombian public. The drug lord commanded considerable loyalty from the poorer sections of the society. The Medellin cartel is no more. The city's murder rate dropped by 80% after the year after Escobar's death. It was the first time that an entire international cocaine production and distribution organization was completely decimated. They didn't just cut off the head of the snake, they chopped the whole snake up. I hope you enjoyed this video. A subscribe to Rich Addict will be great. Also, make sure you like this video. I will see you in the next one.